Hi, good morning. Welcome to the uh, third panel session of the Julian Bond Symposium. Uh, this on the global reach of the civil rights movement. Julian Bond gave his first speech here at the University of Virginia in 1971 before the newly formed African American Student Union. Um, and in that speech, he linked the squashing of dissent here at home to militarism abroad and the struggle against the war in Vietnam to the black freedom struggle that was unfolding here on this and other college campuses. Fittingly, in one of his final speeches on May 2nd, 2015, he spoke at the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial as part of the Vietnam Power Protest Conference, where he reminded the audience of Dr. King's belief that peace and the civil rights movement are inextricably linked. <clears throat> From the start, the civil rights movement was global in its vision and aims, and was profoundly shaped by events that unfolded on the world stage. The struggle for freedom in the U.S. emerged in conjunction with the global fight against colonial powers around the world. A wind is rising, NAACP Executive Secretary Walter White declared in 1945. A wind of determination by the have-nots of the world to share in the benefits of freedom and prosperity which the haves of the earth have tried to keep exclusively for themselves. That wind blows all over the world. Enemies of freedom and equality knew this all too well, and likewise linked the suppression of civil rights in the US to the prosecution of a Cold War around the globe. And Julian Bond's civil rights and anti-war activism during the 1960s exemplified the conjoined nature of these struggles. So it's fitting that we will be voting um, our panel session this morning to looking at this global reach of the civil rights movement and understanding its global dimensions and how the struggle for freedom here at home was being profoundly shaped and influenced by events taking place around the world. Uh, my name is Andrew Carl. I'm an assistant professor here in the history department at uh, the University of Virginia. And it's my pleasure to um, introduce the three speakers for this morning. Um, First up, we will have uh, Robert Trent Vinson, who is the Francis L. and Edwin L. Cummings Associate Professor of History and Africana Studies at the College of William and Mary. He will be followed by J.T. Roan, the McPherson Evelard Postdoctoral Fellow and Lecturer in Africana Studies at Smith College. And then finally by Kwame Otu, Assistant Professor here at the Carter G. Woodson Institute at the University of Virginia. Uh, following um, their prepared remarks, we will have a Q&A session, and um, we look forward to hearing all of your thoughts and comments then. So without any further ado, um, Professor Vinson. Okay, good morning, everyone. Morning. It's wonderful to be here. I want to certainly thank the University of Virginia, uh, uh, the Carter Woodson Center, particularly its director, Deborah McDowell, for inviting me, for putting this, this conference on, for Julian Bond, who I took a couple of courses with, but I never received the grade. <laughs> and, and in fact, he never knew I was actually in the class because, I, <laughs> well, let me tell you why. Uh, he didn't know I was in the class. I never received the grade, but I learned so much because I was a, a, a doctoral fellow. I was writing my dissertation here at the Woodson Center many years ago, and he used to lecture in minor hall in the big auditorium, right next to where the fellows would do their work. So I always made sure to know what time his classes were. And that was the time for me to take a break from my work and sort of loiter outside the, 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 the auditorium where he was. So, so I took his classes, but I never received the grade, but I learned a whole lot. So it's wonderful to, to be here uh, to give this talk with about um, in the context of the civil rights movement and the global reach. My talk today is called Just Means, Nelson Mandela, Albert Latuli, Martin Luther King, and the Turn to Armed Struggle in Apartheid South Africa. And I'm going to be speaking about a time in South Africa, uh, 1961, where strategies of nonviolence were running into great difficulty, precisely at the time that these same strategies were gaining speed in the United States. And we'll look at the, the global links between these two movements and ideas of violence and nonviolence. So if I begin this, my story, I, this is part of a, a biography I'm writing about Albert Latuli. Albert Latuli was Africa's first Nobel Peace Prize winner. He was the leader of the uh, leading anti-apartheid organization, the African National Congress from 1952 to 1967. 
was a husband to Nokukanya Lutuli, the loving father of seven children. And Lutuli was the chief exponent of Gandhian nonviolent civil disobedience in South Africa. He grew the ANC into a mass movement uh, using these strategies of nonviolence to push back against the apartheid regime. And of course, as we have some understanding of, of apartheid and what that looked like in South Africa, uh, the nonviolent strategies of Latuli and others met with great violence from the apartheid state, both in bureaucratic ways and, and, and legislative ways, but also an outburst of spontaneous mass violence. Here's an example, the Sharpeville massacre March 21st, 1960, where nonviolent protesters protesting against apartheid laws, past laws where Africans had to carry passes that restricted their movements. These nonviolent protests were met with great violence. In this instance, in Sharpeville, 69 Africans killed, 180 injured, most shot in the back, running away after the gunfire started. So in this dynamic, in a world that's moving toward decolonization in Africa and Asia, in the Caribbean, where there's a developing civil rights movement, where there is language about racial equality. The United Nations is speaking about human rights and its charter. South Africa is moving in a different direction altogether. And these strategies that seem to be getting increasing success in places like the United States are being closed down. In fact, after the Sharpeville massacre, the South African state doubles down and declares a state of emergency, banning all protests, nonviolent or otherwise. So the African National Congress and other organizations are banned, and they can't organize even peacefully. So in this moment, then, in this moment, the world is paying closer attention to South Africa. And in December 1961, Albert Latuli wins the Nobel Peace Prize. And this is partially in recognition for the nonviolent efforts that he had made throughout the 1950s that looked to be having uh, some difficulty, obviously, at this moment. And this was a moment where, for the ANC, now banned, with many of its leaders forced into exile, this was a type of diplomatic coup for the ANC. This was international recognition that their methods of struggle and the desire for human rights, in which uh, was embedded in this struggle, it was this type of international affirmation for Latuli's ideas of nonviolence. And in his Nobel Peace Prize winning speech, he had two broad themes. One, he couched the South African struggle within a broader global current of racial equality and human rights. He linked the ANC struggle to that international dimension and cast apartheid South Africa as a resurrection of Nazi Germany. So very clearly, we have this dynamic of human rights versus fascist type abuses. He also reaffirms the nonviolent position of the ANC. And this is rather important because he wins this award December 10, 1961. And he's reaffirming that despite the great violence of the South African state and despite the banning of the ANC, that he is pledged to continue under the ANC banner the strategies of nonviolent civil disobedience. December 10th, 1961. As he's flying back into South Africa six days later, something very different happens. A new organization emerges called Umkanto Wisiswe. In Zulu, it means Spear of the Nation. For shorthand, it was known as MK. And this was an organization that engaged in sabotage, attacking the infrastructure of South Africa, not meeting the army head on, but attacking the infrastructure, in this case, electricity pylons that transmitted electricity. They also hit transport links like railway stations. They tried to blow up uh, uh, gas depots where gas was, was stored. So they're trying to hit South Africa at its underbelly. And it announces itself, Umkanto we see it with language that suggests it has some link with the African National Congress. And some of the pamphlets that accompany these bombings declare that nonviolence is dead. And so just at the moment where Latuli has won the Nobel Peace Prize, declaring nonviolence as his preferred strategy, we have this organization seemingly linked to the ANC that's declaring nonviolence to be dead. And this question now, is, this has raised questions then and now. Where was Latuli on this question? 
Was there a level of hypocrisy here? Did he climb the pedestal of peace while stooping to war? Or, and this is a popular view in South Africa, this is the collective memory in South Africa, that Albert Latuli was fully on board to this iconic turn to armed struggle. And MK has this iconic place in the South African liberation struggle and in the minds of South Africa today. The current president, Jacob Zuma, has declared this publicly several times that Albert Latuli, despite winning the Nobel Peace Prize, was fully on board, indeed was planning for armed struggle and gave the name Umkanto Wisizwe to this new organization. That's collective memory. Several historians have pushed back on that idea saying that Ashley Latuli never, ever, at any time, countenanced violence that he was a principled supporter of nonviolence. And in fact, he was overrun. It was a type of internal coup by younger ANC radicals. So he lost control of his organization as the idea, but he maintained his Gandhian nonviolent stance. A third line argues that for the insidious influence of the Communist Party through the Soviet Union, and argues very provocatively that one of these communist men was a young Nelson Mandela that nevertheless had a type of coup of the ANC. My work in this forthcoming biography um, pushes back on that narrative. And because we only have a short amount of time, I will condense greatly. Nelson Mandela was a loyal and disciplined member of the ANC, it is true. He believed in nonviolence as a strategy, not necessarily as a principle. With the closing down of nonviolent protests after the Shotville massacres, Mandela and others thought that nonviolence as a practical strategy could no longer work in South Africa. And he pushed for armed struggle. In a series of meetings in June and July of 1961, and this is new archival evidence coming to the fore in South Africa and in the United States, we see that Mandela and Latuli are on opposite ends of this question. And ultimately, there is a compromise in several meetings, secret meetings. Latuli agrees that MK can be formed as long as it's separate from the ANC. So he's making the argument, as you see here, the ANC is a nonviolent organization. Members have signed up with the premise that this is a nonviolent organization. And as a leader, he cannot unilaterally change the policy, thereby exposing ANC members to whatever violence would become the way, their way from the South African state. So he tells Mandela and others, you go and start that organization. We won't publicly criticize you, we won't discipline you. But as long as you understand that the MK is separate from the ANC and there will be no loss of life, you will engage in sabotage attacks on non-human targets. That's the understanding. When he's apprised in November 1961 that MK has actually formed, he already knows that he's going to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. He's on his way to Oslo to receive this Nobel Peace Prize, and he makes this further distinction that he hates violence, but his version of Christianity does not mean that he will simply turn the other cheek, that he believes in self-defense, and the violence of the apartheid regime has brought the liberation struggle to this point. And so this is the distinction he's making between ANC and MK. And this evidence here um, is at odds with those who argue that Latuli never, ever countenanced violence or did not support MK. Now, of course, again, we have to move quickly. Uh, I will say that uh, Latuli's uh, response to MK that continued to engage and struggle um, eventually, the state was able to crush this early iteration of MK. They were able to round up members, uh, round them up in jail, put them on trial. And this was a moment where the famous iconic Rivonia trial happened in June of 1964, when Mandela and others were tried and convicted. Latuli again makes it clear, saying that these young men had just means to engage in their particular struggle. He's not alone in that assessment, by the way. Martin Luther King Jr., on his way to receive his Nobel Peace Prize in December 1964, makes a stop in London. And he speaks to an international audience, including exiled South Africans. 
and he too is aligned with Latuli. Their relationship had gone back to 1948, where a young Albert Latuli had toured the US South, looking for examples, looking at Jim Crow, comparing it to segregationist forms of, of racial discrimination in South Africa, looking at uh, black political and educational institutions and saying, what can be applicable to South Africa? Martin Luther King Sr. invites Latuli in May of 1948 to come speak at Ebenezer. And here is the moment where Junior and Latuli have an intersection. We often think of, of Albert Latuli in South Africa as the, as the South African version of Martin Luther King. In fact, King himself looked at himself as a follower of Latuli and said that if he had lived in South Africa, he would have followed Latuli, and he regarded himself as the American Latuli. The two worked together on a number of anti-apartheid initiatives. King, from 1957 going forward, looked at the domestic civil rights in a larger global context, in the context of African and Caribbean and Asian decolonization, and looked at the South African struggle as one more form of inspiration, international inspiration. So the two worked together on a number of, of, of anti-apartheid initiatives, uh, uh, corresponded together, and when King arrived at Oslo, he only mentioned one person. He didn't even thank his wife, which I think is kind of basic if you win an award, right? <laughs> <laughs> he immediately, <laughs> I don't know how Coretta felt about that. <laughs> but the person, the one person he mentions in his acceptance speech is Albert Latuli. And so the two are linked and their similar temperament, similar strategies. And at this moment, when both nonviolent and violent strategies in South Africa seem to be closed off temporarily, King is with Latuli in the argument for international nonviolence, economic sanctions, arms embargoes, trading boycotts, isolate South Africa diplomatically, politically, economically, culturally. What King and Latuli are arguing for <laughs> at this moment is what King calls an international nonviolence. And of course, this strategy of eventually isolating South Africa has its greatest effect in the 1980s. And this man, Julian Bond in 1981, as Georgia State Senator, is one of the people arguing for this form of international nonviolence economic sanctions, diplomatic isolation of South Africa, a strategy that ultimately becomes successful in bringing the apartheid regime to the negotiating table. Julian Bond, like his father, Horace Mann Bond, who greatly admired Latuli, thought of the civil rights movement as a Selma to Soweto uh, arc, a global arc, connecting again as a young man at, in, this, in SNCC looking at South Africa, looking at African and Caribbean and Asian decolonization as part of a global struggle for justice. And older Bond now is at the forefront of international nonviolent strategies to end the apartheid regime. I will conclude very quickly by saying that Albert Latuli is a forgotten figure in today's world, but he was really in many ways Mandela before Mandela. The Mandela that we know that came out of jail in the 1990s, speaking the language of a non-racial democratic South Africa. This was Albert Latuli 30 years earlier. Latuli accepted the formation of MK as a tragic consequence of apartheid violence, only sanctioned sabotage and understood that MK advocates had just means to add counter violence to existing political struggle. There's more nuance here than this story is usually given, where it's either all violence or all nonviolence. King followed Latuli's example of international nonviolence. It was Latuli who sparked this movement for economic sanctions globally in the late 1950s. And in this way, then, we see the evolution of not just King, but civil rights activists looking at domestic civil rights to global human rights. And we also see an evolution of the relationship between African Americans and black South Africans. Before this period, black South Africans looked at African Americans as a type of vanguard of the black race, racial models and potential liberators. Here is another example 
of African Americans not necessarily being at the center of a global struggle for justice, but understanding that there is a more reciprocal and equitable transnational relationship between black peoples striving for justice across the world. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Professor McDowell, and, and everybody at the Woodson for this facilitating what's really a homecoming for me. So I graduated from here in 2008 and uh, was a black studies major here. Um, I see so many familiar faces in the audience, and I'm just happy to be here. Um, I want to start just with a little anecdote about what makes this, uh, what I'm thinking about in this paper, really pressing for me. Um, when I was about or nine or ten, my great aunt passed away. Um, she was at the center of my family. Um, and I had this sudden recognition that, um, that we couldn't go to this place that was her home um, any longer, right? She just rented this space, right? And I had no, it never occurred to me that that was the case, right? And so this place that I considered a home place was gone. Um, I want to flash forward to February 2016, um, where my home church, my family's ancestral church in 145-year-old 100, St. John's Baptist Church was um, blown away in uh, a devastating tornado um, that luckily didn't kill anyone, um, but very, very much um, led, left a path of destruction, both of the forest, of people's homes and lives, and then also the, this church. So every, every fond memory I have growing up of, um, of weddings, of baptisms, of all of that is, is destroyed, right? And so it's in that vein that I want to think to you, think with you a little bit today about, um, about black, a sort of black environmentalism, um, but black environmentalism that challenges normative environmentalism. Um, and, and in that um, sort of riffing off the legacy of Julian Bond in his tireless efforts to also include environmental justice and environmental racism as part of his, his um, concerns. So the title is actually Beyond Environmentalism, Black Vitality and the Choreography of Gogo, Forging Life Across Two Geographies of Disaccumulation. So in this paper, I make the case that there is a rich tradition of surviving and thriving at the margins within black communities that provides a livable alternative to the dominant construction of environmentalism. I locate the generative practice of black vitality and the efforts of diasporic communities to grab ingenuity and around belonging onto the necrotic or death-inducing margins of capitalist space. Black vitality, which results from historical displacement and ongoing vulnerability, is anthropocentric and focuses primarily on the extension of new modes of human connectivity. These modalities of human belonging, in turn, query the normative operations of property and man, both of which are at the heart of the, our confluence of social and ecological catastrophe. Black vitality remaps modes of human intimacy and connection outside the dominant model of ownership, articulating hum human infrastructures that reimagine the relationship between center and periphery, human and community, place and belonging. Black vitality engenders thriving, sometimes in the temporality of flashes, in places where nothing is said to exist, and in that unnaming where nothing is expected to live except in its barest forms. While black vitality is not, not often centered explicitly in a concern for the preservation of the global biosphere, the new modalities of life it creates practice a world that is more livable for all, including non-human life. Black vitality is queer, or generatively askew and out of time with the vision of dominant green activists and green capitalists alike who prescribe environmental action through the normative framework of quasi-eugenic selective population control with an and with an emphasis on saving abstractions like the earth or the forest. This specific operation of human subject and mastery over an external object or objects, even in the power to fix or save, replicates the dominant modes of subject-object relations derived historically from dominion, the colonial vision of mastery and subjugation that accompanied the consolidation of Western dominance and hegemony in the Americas. Conversely, practitioners of black vitality place lateral human connections as their object and thus do not predicate the viability of human life on domination, um, both of earth and also not on property ownership, both of which continue to endanger all forms of life on the planet. So I want to exemplify this, what I call black vitality, 
and its ability to displace dominant and problematic environmentalism through a brief treatment of the sonic and choreographic elements of Anacostia and Washington, D.C.'s musical genre, Go-Go. Um, anybody know Go-Go? Mm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a flat girl. You, go, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm housed at Smith right now. I say Go-Go. People are like, okay. <laughs> um, so... So first, I want to set the scene for a specific development in Anacostia um, and to some degree rural Virginia, although that's a, that's a, queer, a sort of queer genealogy that I want to hold on to. Um, and so I want to set the scene, and then I want to provide a sort of brief and necessarily schematic genealogy of Go-Go beyond a sort of band genealogy, right? Um, so let me start with thinking about racial gender capitalism. Racial gender capitalism functions through the generative geographic violence of, board, of displacement, exclusion, and hierarchy codified and managed through small and large scale borders. If capitalism has historically required inequality meted out spatially, then social processes of gendering and racialization have helped to erect and maintain borders for the social reproduction of hierarchy and incommiserateness. As discontinuities in space, Borders demark disparity between large-scale geographic entities like nation states, but however, they also demark spatial limits and determine who or what a group be views as belonging inside or outside of a smaller, uh, smaller scale community. Um, and, uh, and likewise, what communities disavow connection with. So blackness has come to signify the ultimate social border, a radical exterior outside of the designated places of collectivity, responsibility, and community in this country, but also in the wider world. This condition of social alienation and alterity relegates the diaspora's community in turn to liminal geographies, to the spaces where capital is disaccumulated or harvested in its elemental forms. So the black edges of space are where the processes of earth resource commodification destroy ecologies, and human inhabitants alike. And although they often appear outside the space of profiteering, these are the generative edges that in fact help to constitute the center or also the symbolic site of accumulation. So disaccumulation and accumulation. Um, the processes of racial gender capitalism have relegated black communities to these edges, borders, interstices, and other liminal or generative, if also disparaged and death-inducing spaces within capitalist geographies, and these are Often, the site, often sites of disproportionate toxicity. Um, for example, the oil-powered urbanization of, and these processes are linked, right? And that's what I want to demonstrate briefly with this example of Anacostia. So for example, the oil-powered urbanization of Maryland's lower counties, um, as well as the upper ones of Virginia, facilitated the economic abandonment of Washington's neighborhoods, especially those east of the Anacostia. The extensive new highways required for rapid development and automobility created high concentrations of polynuclear aromatic compounds, or PACs. Cleared land and development that decreased the forests surrounding the Anacostia's tributaries by a dramatic 70% between 1970 and 2000 created the conditions for the rapid runoff of these PACs into the Anacostia, raising its toxicity, especially in its silt deposits. Um, there's a recent study, and this is actually down from the 1970s, um, more than 20% of, of catfish in the Anacostia have either skin or liver cancer, right? So we're talking about dramatic toxicity. And people still use the Anacostia to fish, right? I mean, I think that's part of the power of black vitality is that black folks are trying to hold on to the river to reproduce their lives. And if they were, if that, that would require that the river be cleaned up, right? And not in the way that, oh, we're going to clean it up and move y'all out. Because um, that's often what is happening. That's actually what's happening. Um, so despite or perhaps be precisely because of this proximity, indeed intimacy to the ongoing seismic disruptions of North American ecologies, black communities have created distinct epistemes and knowledges. And I want to hold on to epistemes and knowledges. Black people don't get held to hold distinct ways of thinking and knowing. And we do. Um, not just practicing, although practice is a part of that, we also know things. Um, I think that's important to recall. Um, distinct episteme, epistemes and knowledges that while not on their face concerned about the environment, practice other kinds of infrastructures or modes of human connection that create relationships between places 
and which are not based on exclusion and, and abandonment. There are, in fact, other modes of human connection. It's not vitally evident in the United States um, across difference besides domination. And black artistry, the spaces of Richard's I Richard Eiken's fantastic, for Ra Francesca Royster's eccentric, for Chuck Brown's polyphonic wind me up, is often where these alternatives flourish. If planners design highways to erect borders between the socially acceptable and the vulnerable, these should be understood as infrastructures of death because of their effects on human uh, populations in an urban neighborhood, but also the river. Um, if suburb, suburbs were built as a way to disconnect from the city, to remove oneself and one's family from the necrotic geographies of disaccumulation and abandonment, Anacostia's residents also forged in the same period one of chocolate cities, and I'm trying to hold on to that. It, it's, <laughs> it's waning, but let's hold on to it. Um, most life-generating gifts to us all, and that's go-go. Um, so go-go is a queer embodied practice that reworks the element, and I don't mean queer in the sexualized sense, although I will come back um, to how that those things aren't, aren't um, antithetical. Go-go is a queer embodied practice that reworks the elements of the post-funk sonic and motion universe to forge vitality across various sites of disaccumulation. Go-go is queer in the sense that it is non-normative and often disreputable. It is queer in the sense that it engenders odd temporalities and spatialities. It is queer in the sense that it is a reservoir of black eccentric performance that is enticingly, read dangerously, out of time with the operations of the dominant cartography of the metro. Gogo sustains other kinds of life, even as those in charge try to excise it and its bearers and practitioners from the region. In practice, Gogo reworks the relationship between time and space, building out from ancestral visions of fugitivity. Fugitive time and operations of place are, in Fred Moten's estimation, fleeting, quote, moments of escape, of stolen life, not reducible to simple interdiction or, and or bare transgression that underwrites black people's alternative visions for futurity and collectivity outside of simple utility or captivity. If the rationalized geographies of plantations turn merciless tracks of unsustainable highways and houses are oil-based infrastructures of efficiency, borders, and death, Gogo maps connectivity across planes of space and moments of time that allow vitality to flourish between spaces where capitalism and policymakers say there wasn't anything intelligible as life. Go-Go is a kind of black noise, where black noise represents the kinds of political aspirations that, that are inaudible and ineligible or illegible within the prevailing formulas of political rationality. These yearnings are illegible because they are often so wildly utopian and derelict in the face of capitalism. Much to the chagrin of, the, of its practitioners, Go-Go has never readily been marketable beyond the area between Central Virginia and Lower Maryland, which is why I have to ask you if you know it. <laughs> um, uh, and that's mostly because of its highly improvised songs. Um, there's no clear beginning. There's no clear end. Um, and that's the first register of its creativity. The second register of its queer temporality is its affiliation with the dark hours. So when I was growing up, Go-Go's, especially those with multiple bands, never really started before midnight, right? Um, the third and perhaps most profound sense in which Go-Go is queer in relation to temporality is its, um, is its relationship with generation. OK, I'm winding down on time, so I'm going to break off script here. Um, and so what, what I wanted to say about this is um, I want to, I think Gogo maps onto a, a, a unique cultural script that was forged between up, uh, Mar Lower Maryland and Central Virginia that's much older. We go to 1937 WPA interview with James V. Dean, for example, who's living at Baltimore at the time of his interview. He says, when we, he recalls, when we wanted to meet at night, we had an old conch that we blew. Um, we would meet on the bank of the Potomac River and sing across the river to the slaves in Virginia, and they would sing back to us. This is the kind of cultural script that Gogo -Go builds out from. And I think, um, I think as well, <coughs> there was parts of an oral history which I wanted to share with you, um, but where um, Angela, Nina Angela Mercer, a wonderful playwright and, um, and choreographer who got her start in Gogo -Go in D.C., discusses how she comes to realize that actually her father like forged this program under Marion Barry that she um, that she 
participates in as part of the show mobile, right? So there's this moment of di misrecognition where she doesn't realize that her father um, forced this program, but GoGo -Go is this sort of cultural matrix which allows for a generative connection across generation and time. I want to end by thinking about how GoGo -Go, um, thinks about death, um, and ironically, in thinking about black vitality, we have to think about death, right? Um, that's part of it. I think, you know, Baldwin says something to the effect of black folks know life because they hold death so closely, right? And I think that's the case for GoGo, -Go, especially between these two, G if we're talking about rural Virginia in the 90s and DC starting in the 70s and 80s, these are sites where too many black people go too young, right? Um, I'm reminded on this, um, as I stand before you, that just um, just about a week ago, um, Marcus Pitts, who was a go-go singer in a band with my older brother, was killed tragically in a, um, a head-on collision with a lumber truck, right? And so not often are these are rural places like rural Virginia as a site of disaccumulation and its death producing effects so literal, right? But literally, he runs into a lumber truck that's on these back roads, right? This site of abstraction is a site of death. Um, and I think if we, if we push, if we pull back from that, um, I want to turn very quickly to thinking about um, Essex Hemphill, um, the black gay poet who was born in Chicago, I believe, but is raised for most of his life in Anacostia. Um, he, he describes how he wants his funeral to look, right? He says, my witness will have to be, and this is in Tomb of Sorrow, my witnesses will have to bear will have to answer to go-go -go music. Dancing and sweat will be required at my funeral. Even in these spaces of death, even in these spaces of death, the naming of death, life is articulated and generated through the sweaty go-go, -go, right? Um, and I, I mean, I wanted to go with you through a, a whole bunch of bands who talk a lot about death, um, but the point there is um, that this is, a, this is a cultural script, a cultural practice that black folks are dealing with necrotic geographies and the possibilities of life that are created within that are not only going to um, create the possibilities and conditions of life for black communities, but also other living things. So I'll, I'll end with Beam's words. I too sleep nights, and he's right into, um, he's right into, not Beam, Hemphill's words, he's right into Joseph Beam, another um, really important figure, Philly-based black gay anthologist. He says, I too sleep nights, and all I dream are tall blue trees with strong torsos and muscular thighs. And I too miss the domestic repetition of beauty that is found in caring for and being cared for by a lover. This is a letter that I actually want to wish you well with, and to tell you quite frankly, I love you for the man you are, which is why I believe our friendship will be forever, a friendship tied to waffles and a diner a friendship tied to concerns that when, when galvanized will save us all. So I think GoGo -Go maps these modes of connection and possibility at the margins and of necrotic geographies which capitalism requires. Inequality is required for capitalism. Um, and race just happens, race and gender just happen to create those and make those real um, and naturalize those. Um, it's, it's within those spaces that black communities forge these life generating practices even in the name of the sweaty go-go, -go, that when mobilized, gonna save us all, including the fish and the trees and all of that. Okay. <laughs> um, good morning. Good, good afternoon. Sorry, <laughs> yeah, it's exactly twelve. Uh, so before I actually start my uh, my talk, I'd like to begin with like an akan, akan aphorism, which is, which blends. Uh, I'm Ashanti. I'm from Ghana, and uh, it blends um, Christian logics with you know traditional ideas of. I'm thinking, it, it says, uh, I'll speak in my language and then translate it into English. Um, it says, Paul Lambantem a Saint Edicamfo, which means that the Apostle Paul in the Bible uh, was late in arriving, but exceeded right, the boundaries and the bounds of Christ. Um, because Paul actually finds, uh, founds Christianity, as it were. And I would like to say that it is in the same vein that I actually um, see uh, Professor Julian Bond, whom I did not know. I would have wished I did know him. I think that his work, especially as I plumb through the archive for the talk I'm about to give, uh, says a lot about me as someone who does work in, in Ghana and in Africa in general um, uh, than you know, a student here. So um, my the title of my talk is well, I said a student, a professor here. Um, I am 
Kwame Adrino Chu, and I'm an assistant professor at the Kadaji Wilson Institute. Uh, the title of my paper is Bonding with Afro Queer Diasporas, Julian Bond Transnational <laughs> LGBTI Human Rights Activism and the LGBTI Situation in Post Colonial Africa. I'm particularly interested in this because uh, yesterday, I think it was Madame Judy Richardson who mentioned that Julian Bond had actually met the young Nkrumah. Kwame Nkrumah was actually one of the foremost. Uh, Pan-Africanist, you know, forces in the con on the continent, and so the talk I'm going to deliver basically would like to recognize Bond as, you know, also a Pan-Africanist figure, if you will, um, and we never actually think about that. So I start. In a 1978 speech delivered by Julian Bond, he meditates over his brief experience in Southern Africa, reflecting fondly upon that stint. He declared, and I quote, "Africa is my root." My ancestors came from the west coast of Africa. Every black American has a stake in the continent, a birthright stake as well as a history of our own involvement in the 200-year-old American struggle to make democracy real. The cancer on the continent is South Africa. The sooner it is arrested and cured, the healthier we will be." End of quote. Not taking for granted here the mere expression of the pronoun we in Bond's reflection, I unpack how it informed his impulse for a transnational movement broad enough to attract a large section of the population, real enough to have some expectation of implementation, and human enough to solve the problems which most Americans have in some measure. In other words, the we invoked by Bond drew much closer and even nearer the experiences of blacks in apartheid South Africa to those of black Americans in the United States. It was a clarion call to black Americans that the struggle for liberation on both continents, albeit occurring in and under very different circumstances, was closely related than was imagined. Bond's speech resulted from a conference he had attended in the Kingdom of Lesotho, the landlocked island in the eye of the Republic of South Africa. The trip marked his third visit to the continent. Unlike his two previous visits, this particular journey had profoundly solidified his relationship to Africa in general and to South Africa in particular. By claiming a birthright stake in, the, in Africa, Bond reimagined how far he could go with his participation in a civil rights politics which untethered African descended populations and Africans in both the United States and Africa. With an energized fondness for the continent, Bond reveals the, quote, inseparable connection between black Africa and black America, end of quote. For him, that racist rendering of Africa as, quote, the dark continent because of the color of its people and because it was mysterious and dark, populated by different tribes who speak in different tongues, had lasting consequences, of which the apartheid route in South Africa was a brute example. The Africa we know today, therefore, for him, grew out of a crazy quilt of colors, representing countries drawn <coughs> by European hands, respecting no boundary of region or geography, representing instead the avariciousness of the colonial powers, by which he was referring to the scramble for Africa by Europeans. While it is evident that Bond was fairly aware of the lasting legacies of colonial rule and the concomitant racist infrastructure out of which Africa was designed, it is the situation of black citizens in apartheid South Africa that most appealed to him at the Lesotho Conference. Intent, therefore, on coupling black freedom projects in the United States with anti-apartheid struggles in apartheid South Africa to make a case for transnational black, a transnational black freedom politics, Bond aggressively opposed America's complicity in the white supremacist, super, supremacist regime that exacerbated black suffering. The business dealings between American multinational corporations such as IBM, Mobile Oil, General Motors, to give but a partial list, laid bare the contradictions in the crucible in which American democracy was forged. For him, America couldn't profess to practice democracy at home and pursue anti-black and dehumanizing campaigns by copulating with white supremacist regimes abroad. In this presentation, I draw on Julian Bond's reflection to make a case for a transatlantic 
qua transhistorical confluence, right, inherent in black liberatory, liberatory politics. And just how Bond leaves us with a monumental social activist legacy that compels us to rethink the pursuit of LGBT human rights politics in contemporary post-colonial Africa. Drawing on Bond's visit to the continent, continent touted in Euro-American ima liberal imaginaries as the dark continent, I unpack how he widened the contours of civil rights through his participation, participation in anti-apartheid struggles. Similar to his, partic his participation much later in the LGBT human rights movement here, I make a case that Bond's activism extended beyond geography and time, and that he valued the interlocking and entangling nature of identities in his fight for equal rights and social justice. Here, I regard Bond as a transnational activist actively in, a, in global anti-colonial and anti-apartheid movement which stretch the borders of the civil rights movement, a movement that continues to outshine his transnationalist exploits. Moreover, he engages in a pragmatic oriented activism, one that value, ha, valued having citizens steer democracy, a citizen democracy, if you will, which existence was made possible by a radical movement that held accountable the democratic apparatus. Bond's activist purchase, personified by a politics of becoming, implied that he brought along with him his activist tendencies wherever he went, in whatever he did, and with whomever, with whomever he interacted. In effect, Bond not only traveled with his activism, but also led an activist life. That Bond's activist contributions cross borders and oceans to shake the foundations of South Africa's white supremacist regime and the rancid shoddiness and duplicity of American liberal democracy permits a critique of neoliberal LGBT human rights politics in Africa in the contemporary moment. Mm -hmm. To make sense of the situation of apartheid, Bond recounted Europe's pitiless appropriation of Africa and its vast resources and people, re-echoing the famous idiom that when the Europeans arrived on the continent, they gave her original inhabitants the Bible and then seized their lands, Bond locates the injustices at the root of apartheid in the moment of Europeans' encounter with Africa. Temporarily, uh, which basically, so I'm making the argument here that that moment of the encounter we have with Europeans or white supremacists, if you will, really is, is uh, inaugurates this contact zone of no return, right? So then this encounter with European really um, glooms or puts Africa in a state of gloom. His turn to the historical foundations of apartheid thus compelled him to demand that whites there atone for the injustices they wrought on black South Africans. Aware that the United States, a nation holding in such uh, a nation that held in such high regard democracy, yet pilloried sections of its, its citizenry by disenfranchising them based on the color of their skin, Bond demanded that the U.S. government froze any dealings it had with South Africa. His intercessions proved how liberal America, that land of the free and home of the brave, contributed to the violence the apartheid government unleashed on blacks in South Africa. Now, I seek to return to the quote from Bond with which I began this presentation to examine just how his address to Americans and especially black Americans initiated him into a brand of Pan-Africanism animated by praxis. I need to fertilize my body. <laughs> I, <laughs> I argue that by calling on his compatriots to address seriously the South African situation, Bond reconfigures the project for freedom for blacks in the United States as exceeding both territorial and temporal, temporal existence of, for Africans, both on the continent and in the diaspora. At the time Bond professed his reflection, the Civil Rights Act had been legislated while South Africa continued to wallow in the fiery foundries fanned by the apartheid regime. Reflecting on the condition in South Africa vis-a-vis -vis the United States, Bond's demand that the U.S. government abort any interaction with the apartheid regime formed part of his quest for a transnational civil rights advocacy and movement that contributed to the anti-apartheid movement. For him, although the passage of the Civil Rights Act may have transformed the racial politics of the United States, such accomplishment did not bookend the struggle for black liberation which was itself a global project. 
It is evident then that Bond inaugurates a brand of Pan-Africanist politics that embraces black freedom making as a transcendental project that, os that also exceeds the demarcations of time. Here, both race women and race men not only waged the movement for apartheid-free South, South Africa, but also saw the fight for freedom as preserving the edge to keep going. Calling for a more assiduous effort among Americans to be interested in the vices of white supremacy in South Africa, he reminded black Americans that while the passage of the Civil Rights Act in the United States may have been a historically symbolic feat, such accomplishment would be even more effective if linked to the liberation of blacks in apartheid South Africa. This agency in Bond's reflection for a transcendental politics of black liberation reveals the degree to which he valued a coalitional movement that worked to effectively curb projects of white supremacy that dis diminished black lives. While I do not seek to overstate Bond's relevance here, I emphasize and even ask why Bond remains obscure in the context of transnational black politics of liberation, claiming that he does not only belong to the Americans, but he belongs to us, the Africans, too. Therefore, if he had a birthright stake in Africa, we, too, have a birthright stake in him. Where then does Bond stand in relation to Africa and what shadows of Africa are on his mind? It is apparent that his intense interest in the continent is embodied by his active involvement in the struggle to end apartheid in South Africa. On yielding in that opposition to the economic ties between liberal United States and the white supremacist regime, I argue that Bond's politics bless the boundaries. Can't I get fugitive time? <laughs> I argue that Bond's politics blurs the contentious line between black diasporic activist movement and Pan-Africanist freedom movement, right? So he resists the seductive aftermath of the civil rights win, right, and, di and directs his attention to South Africa just to aid the anti-apartheid pro projects there. For instance, at a 1981 forum called Public Investment in South Africa, organized in New York, Bond declared, and I quote, we are here to complete the process of halting American complicity in the most hideous government on the face of the planet. The one system where racial superiority is constitutionally enshrined. We gather here at a time when even the most moderate advances away from complicity are, are being compromised, abandoned, and withdrawn. He continues, if it is difficult, our task is not impossible. Events in South Africa daily demonstrate that we are a part of a quickening struggle whose outcome has never been in serious doubt. We can make a great contribution to that struggle if all who truly believe in freedom will join us. Ours then is a subtle request to ask our neighbors, the people with whom we share this country, to refuse to finance the domination of one set of human beings by another. Surely, that is a reasonable appeal. South Africa today constitutes a direct personal threat to us all. Forty years ago, Adolf Hitler demonstrated that genocide is yet possible even in democracy, even among people who, who look alike. It is evil supreme and we cannot allow it to continue to be neutral on this issue, to continue to be neutral on this issue to join the other side. Now, I'd like to at least keep over this talk, seeing as I'm very short, of, short on time, to think about how Bond's critique of, of the anti-apartheid struggle was not something, or was not just his participation in the struggle, but he was very, very vehemently opposed to those discourses that actually produced Africa as, you know, the the heart of darkness, right? Because for him, such discourses are actually what sustain the apartheid, the apartheid infrastructure, right? So I, I try to make the link between Bond's sort of critique of discourse because there's a certain ideological apartheid that we overlook, <coughs> right? That apartheid is not just infrastructural, infrastructural. It's also very ideological, and that these uh, two structures are always interpenetrating each other. So Bond's critique of that discourse of Africa as a dark continent allows me to think about the ways in which Africa is framed currently in the context of LGBT human rights politics as the heart of homophobic darkness, because what one tells me from what I've read in the archive is that he's really not an armchair activist. Bond is really act, like, actively involved with the movement. He is really an anthropologist, if you will. He's really engaged in a form of participant observation 
right? So his participation in the movement affords him a vocabulary to be able to unsettle and to be able to make the connections between the fact that if we are fighting against the infrastructure, we must deal with the discourses that actually continue to you know, feed and nourish right, the existence of these structures. So in my own work, I, I, I find Bond useful because I'm trying to see the extent to which what happens on the ground by not being an armchair activist, you know, um, can help us think about the ways in which we do LGBT human rights politics in Africa. Because for the most part, I think that uh, it's a very ahistorical project that we never conceive or think about the ways in which, you know, homophobia in the, on the continent, right, is really connected to colonial infrastructures, to the preponderance of Christianity, um, and sort of the new form or novel forms of neoliberal uh, human rights politics that ignore the continuation of you know, the racial infrastructure that you know, these are, these are all raised, right? So that's the extent to, to which I'm trying to uh, utilize Bond for my own work. And with that, I say a big thank you to you for listening to me. <laughs> Um, before I go any further, I just wanted to announce that um, there will be books of the conference participants on sale um, during the lunch period to follow shortly. But we have a few moments here um, for questions. And again, all three of these papers in many in, in different ways powerfully underscore as Julian Bond's life um, and activism also remind us that the fate of black people in the U.S. has been and remains linked to the fate of oppressed people around the world and as well, the fate of the planet itself. So um, with that, um, we'll sort of allow for some time for questions of these three um, distinguished panelists. Yes? To uh, here, a question. Uh, a combination of, of, of both jail and exile seem to have wanted the thrust of not just MK, but A and C, E and C. Can you talk about that? I said, uh, <laughs> I was asking Professor, a question is to Professor Vincent. I, I was starting to say that it seems as if a combination of jail and exile blunted the thrust not only of MK, but PAC, ANC, and any number of organizations in South Africa. And then there's a, long, a relatively lengthy period of quiet and then there's a surge of activism. I'm thinking of the black consciousness movement here. And I have a two part, two loosely related parts of my question. One is that surge of youthful activism, a surge of nonviolent activism in South Africa, because it does not seem to be armed struggle. And secondly, are the tensions that existed between these youthful activists and the more established leadership of ANC, PAC, et cetera, in any way comparable to the kinds of tensions we see between young people in the movement of Black Lives Matter or the movement for Black Lives and the more established leadership here in the United States. Um, Nonviolent stuff can get you killed sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's Charlie Cobb's book. That's Charlie Cobb's oh, oh, recent book. Right? So, um, I, I should add something. You know, when you're talking fast, you miss things. And um, the, the struggle, the, the, the desire to turn to armed struggle, had international examples from South Africa, Cuba, and Algeria were the, the immediate examples, but there were others. And I'm, I'm mentioning that because uh, when um, MK folk and PAC folk went into exile, um, they one, one thing that happened was, even though initially that early phase of sabotage did not have material success in terms of bringing the South African state to the negotiating table, it had tremendous symbolic value. It sent the signal that the struggle was not over. So maybe it had to be more underground. Uh, but there was still this desire, obviously, for liberation. Then there was this important dynamic of there were people fighting that. Um, now, to, to specifically to that, that question, I think that that um, helped inspire the next generation of black consciousness folk um, in South Africa who were inspired by black power in the U.S. and liberation theology coming out of primarily Latin America. Um, 
the theorists, the educational theorists about prayer. So again, the international connections are there. And the connection there is that black consciousness fought the battle against apartheid intellectually. Right? That was an important dynamic. So the, the struggle is being fought on multiple fronts. Right? Simultaneously, I think after Soweto, after the Soweto massacre, many of those young people, by the thousands, leave the country. Many of them end up in MK camps right? outside of South Africa. So there's that link there between um, if you will, nonviolent struggle in the early 1970s, but then deciding, yes, we need to go to MK uh, to reinvigorate this movement. So I hope that got to the question. You get a second part. I was wondering, but there seemed to have been tensions. Tensions, between, yeah. You know, and how comparable is it to some of the tensions you see here today? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the dynamics in the ANC between Latuli and Mandela was part of these generation tensions that. Um, I look at it as that actually very dynamic and ultimately productive. Um, those tensions within the ANC create, you know, brought different voices, different strategies to the table. And that it made it clear that there was not just one way to struggle. Right? And I think that dynamic today uh, connects because I think you see this in the civil rights movement, you know this better, far better than me. You had to have that generational dynamic of younger people pushing. National military, more idealistic, pushing, pushing, and a young, and an older generation uh, thinking about other forms of struggle as well. So I hope I'm getting to your question. Yeah, I'm not going to worry about the group because they're making back and forth on this. We'll talk. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the panel. Uh, Professor Lawrence, can you expound a little bit on the uh, on your go-go example, which I wish you had played some. Me <laughs> too. <laughs> <laughs> um, because your your uh, your uh, paradigm of, of queerness is very provocative, and I, when you were speaking, I was thinking that it could be expanded, you know, to many forms of, of uh, historic, historically specific and geographically specific. Uh, musical forms. It could easily easily be applied to what Thomas Dorsey was doing in Chicago in the 1920s. The song said, with no beginnings, in, in, in its performance context anyway, no beginning, no middle, no end, because, you know, people, uh, it's a soundtrack for paranor paranormal events like uh, spirit visitations and things like that. And, and everything that uh, uh, Hemphill was saying could be applied to Go go and house music. So, I, it's, it's not a challenge, but I'd like you to expound a little bit because you use go go specifically, and I'd like to know if you think that could be easily applied across the board, or is there something uh, exceptional in your analysis about go go? Thank you. That's a great question. <laughs> um, definitely, there's a shared set of vernacular practices across Black like, communities and in the U.S. in terms of musical culture, and I think as well beyond in the wider diaspora that are, that we could sort of map as similar. Part of the part of the reason that I focus on GoGo -Go is because I'm trying. This is an exploratory essay, more centric project where I'm really trying to think very deeply about urban rural connections in rural Virginia. Um, and so that's for me. That's the particular of GoGo. -Go. I think it's it's it it, it, um, it sort of rests on a larger culture set of diasporic cultural um, scripts, um, but it's particular to the specifics of this specific sonic universe and also the space, what I'm arguing is this, the spatial design of Washington and it's sort of um, beyond, um, because we don't think about GoGo -Go in a place like um, rural Virginia, we think about it as very DC centric, but when those bands start getting kicked out of uh, 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 um, you know, all these spaces in the 1990s, where did they come? They come to King, Queen, and Essex, and all these little, you know, one horse towns in Virginia, right? Um, like where I'm from. And so, and so, so for me, that's, that's part of it. Um, I think, and part of it is, I am, I'm trying, in a larger paper of this, I'm trying to map exactly this, where, like, if, you know, if we, we could go back to plantation ecologies and think about future yeah. temporalities and but we can also go to the spaces that are in the era of urban renewal, black and on the map is obsolete, right? Um, and the scene is, and, and so it's really these sort of death-inducing geographies and what, what 
um, a larger cultural script that emerges out of them. And that, and, and, that, and, and I'm, I'm thinking about Nina, when I interviewed Nina this past May, um, she pointed out to me, because my experience with Gogo is very 90s, 2000s, right? So the bands are different, even the same bands, seemingly same bands like Junkyard, et cetera, got a whole new group. <laughs> it, ain't, it ain't none of the same people. You know they might perform some of the same songs. Um, and so um, she pointed out, and she, she's very 80s Gogo, right? And so there's a whole other, there's, they're very different and, and very DC. Centric, like going around, going to, you know, performing with the showmobile at Barry Farms is not my experience of going to a go go in Lower King, Moon County, right? Um, but, that, but her point to me in talking to that was that, like, the power of it is that, there's a, that there are futures that are forged in that, right? That the fact that it can continue, despite the fact that it's closed out. Um, and queerness in relation, I mean, part of it, I mean, it's not queerness. You know, and all this sort of multiplicity that I'm trying to hold out, but also on the sexual potential, like in terms of sexuality. For myself, as a at at the time, very closeted queer black young person in rural Virginia, Gogo was the only music that you were allowed to move to as a man, right? And so there's something about that. Pop, just like in the church, I mean, you know, the, there's something. That's about, the, and that's my point, actually. Uh -huh. You know, because the church is a space where. I mean, the whole thing about the sensuality mm -hmm. of gospel music, pious living is marked sonically by mm -hmm. very dramatic, bodily, sensual. Where it didn't. Yeah. <laughs> and I, 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 just to close out on that, I think, um, I mean, that, that's so, it's, and also nostalgia is organized in my turn to go go, right? And I think, I mean, we write off nostalgia. Um, often to our parallel as historians, we don't want to account for memory or nostalgia. One, they do a lot more work than than uh, formal history does quite often in how, in how people move and act in the world. Um, but I think as well, I, I mean, I don't think it's always a bad thing. I mean, obviously Hitler mobilizes nostalgia, or the or the South, the folks that Bond and, and others and SNCC are responding to are mobilizing a certain type of plantation nostalgia. But there are other forms of nostalgia, right, that are that are insurgent, and so I think that's part of why I'm also a this angle. Thank you. Yes, I um, I thought that all the presentations were wonderful. And I had so many questions. I wanted to um, talk about Go Go again because going, I, I'm from Washington. I was trying to fix your accent because people are trying to figure out where I'm from. Uh, <laughs> I didn't figure out where you're from. But I. Um, I did Louisiana. I got a little curve. Now going back to DC is no longer Dr. City. Right. Um, and Gogo has been criminalized in so many ways that you can't, go, you know, you can't, can't perform in certain places, even in Maryland. They pass the laws and rules now around noise and it's forbidden that you this didn't happen before. But in my experience with seeing Gogo bands recently, even with no other soccer city, there's usually a small group of white people who are there. And they're in the front, you know. And it's very disorienting because these spaces are very segregated. You know, it's a very segregated, it's a very black space. You never would see white people. You would see, it's always one white boy. Right. Right. We call it right. It's always one white male or something, but you never see a group. And so I'm wondering, too, what is that doing with the music and how artists respond to that? And also, how do they participate in calling response? Oh, okay. How do they participate in the way that the music is organized around neighborhoods mm -hmm. where you're representing your neighborhood? You know, and now they are occupying these right. spaces. And I just can't understand. I, just, I, just, I, just, I wonder how artists are going to, you know, this is so rich, what you're doing. And, uh, you know, I, I just was, I just wonder if you, maybe you don't have a response, but that was just an observation I'm making now that, you know, um, the DC is being gentrified and like people being pushed out, and now these communities, you know, very few um, are starting to be integrated in some ways in the audience. And the, the dynamic, the cultural dynamic is, you know, it's very interesting. Well, I appreciate those reflections and questions. I mean, I, I do think the, the map that Gogo articulates and that Benz articulates is very different than the 1980s and the 1990s where people get on the mic and call and response and rep their section of the city. Um, you think, I can think about Mambo Sauce's like 2009 um, album where they, they met, they're talking about the DMV. No longer they even talking about Chocolate City of DC, they like DMV. 
And so that's part of what Dean and Mercer helped to point out to me, that there is a futurity, even because I was coming to it from like, like a nostalgic loss, like Bobo is gone from DC. The other side of that is where it thrives in rural spaces. As I opened my presentation, I mean, Marcus Pitts, God rest his soul, is, is gone now, but he was a part of, there's a whole, there are two or three bands in between Essex, King William, and King Queen counties, right? That are all black and they're still, let me tell you, ain't no white folks showing up to the to the parties. <laughs> and they're, they're, they're marked as disreputable and they're fleeting because when they're allowed to have, I mean, the thing is, gun violence, in the same way that it was policed out of DC in relation to gun violence is being policed out of rural Virginia, as if gun violence is like, is, 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 flourishing because of the music, right? The, the music is responding to the same thing that the gun violence is a response to. But there's a collapse of all of that. And so I think there are places, I think that's why I want to bring um, a more, a different genealogy into thinking about Bobo, to take it into rural places, where it still does, and it still is quite distinct. And some of those, I mean, I just went to a beer and crab festival in Carolina. You know, back in, in the 80s, they used to have beer and crab festivals um, in the country. Um, now they have because crabs expensive, so they have they have beer and fish festivals. And so I went to one. I mean, you know, and everybody everybody is dressed in white in this dusty dusty little outdoor spot. That's a whole other story. Everybody's dressed in white on procession. You know, just beautiful, right? Um, I think it's still flourishing, and I think that's what I'm trying to like say is that it may not be where we trying to locate it at, but it's somewhere. We have time for one more question. Hi. Um, so I have a question. I I read a book when I was an undergrad called The Wretched of the Earth by Franz Fanon. And it was really the first time that I was enlightened on how the civil rights movement in the United States had an impact on peoples around the world, disenfranchised people, oppressed people across the world. And I think now even with the Black Lives Matter movement, you see that it is taking hold over other parts. We've seen things in London, we've seen things in Amsterdam, and throughout. And so it's apparent that there is struggle um, throughout the world as far as the African diaspora is concerned. So my question is, it doesn't seem logical, or is there a way in which, um, because clearly the United States needs to lead when it comes to civil rights and progression uh, worldwide, to create some form of pan-African alliance that crosses borders. I know there are struggles within Latin America. Latin America is not talked about that often, but I've, I've lived there and I've seen it for myself. So it's finding ways in which to establish an alliance which true movement, true progression to stop oppression um, can actually happen. Is that something that is being done? Is it something that people are just are not, maybe the math is not aware of because I'm not fully aware of myself? Um, so I'm just interested to hear what you all think as far as the possibilities of something like that, if there is something that already exists, and how to become a part of it to make it larger and more apparent throughout global media. I think that's a very, that's a very good question, but it's also one that's very difficult to, to respond to. Uh, I know that the Black Lives Matter movement now has uh, chapters on like in most many parts of the world, right? And I recently saw a video from South Africa uh, where you know uh, blacks they were basically calling out uh, police brutality, right? So in some way, I can say that the internet is revolutionizing these connections, right? It's, it's really shrinking the movement, you know, by making it global. But the thing is that the very idea of a Pan-Africanist logic seems to have fizzled out because of, you know, the, the baggage that came with Pan-Africanism as this uh, very utopian idea. Um, but I do foresee, and for someone who comes from, from, from Ghana, I, I think d different sets of problems, right, uh, present themselves to different sets of people. And for many black people in Africa, which is really tautological, because all Africans are black, uh, I don't really yet see people mobilizing around, you know, these issues of race, right? So, and I think that is, um, I speak especially about Ghana, right? That the, the very idea or concept of race which is there uh, seems to be overlooked uh, because we are governed by, you know, African governments, we have rulers who are 
value it and all of that. Um, but I do believe that with whatever is happening in South Africa right now, especially when recently those young girls attacked the, the school, I mean, responded to the school for actually discriminating against their life, against them because of their hair, there's something going on and it, it's going to swell up. It takes time. This is really all very, um, uh, it's, it's a snail's effort, right? And I, from, if I'm able to talk about race in Ghana now, I actually see that as an iteration of the movement. Right, because I couldn't have done that as a Ghanaian scholar because that's how that's not how we were taught at the University of Ghana. Race really wasn't part of the conversation, although it is there, right? So I do believe that it's, it's very, very slow, but things are happening. The fact that we are able to talk about blackness in Africa, right, in the contemporary moment, is itself a manifestation of, of the possibility of this larger of, of an alliance amongst black peoples around the world. Mm. Uh, well, I think we are about, to, uh, about time to break for lunch, but let's, before we go, let's give one last round of applause. For